Hey everybody, welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. Everyone, if you are watching on YouTube, can you please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel? It's just a great way to support the show. And if you are listening on any platform and are able to leave a review, a five-star review, can you please go <laughs> leave a review for us? Again, it just tells the algorithm to get more people on board with our podcast and it just really helps us out. Thank you so much. That was a good plug, babe. Thank you. And I'm going to plug something too. If you want bonus content or ad-free content, we have Patreon and Apple subscriptions. Both of those have ad-free content and bonus content. It is the same content. I am also going to join the plug train again and say, Jeez. go listen to our other two shows, Binged Podcast and Rising Crime. Rising Crime is true crime news updates and Binged is basically murder with my husband minus Garrett. Sucks. Okay, you guys, we love you. We are getting into Garrett's 10 seconds. All right, well, football season is around the corner. I am in a couple different fantasy leagues. You know, I usually don't do good at fantasy football and that is because I tend to pick players that I like on teams that I like rather than the players that I should pick. But this year I pick people that I should pick. We'll see what happens. We'll see. Usually we play for like 10 to 50 bucks a person, depending on um, who I'm doing it with. So we'll see if I, you know, lose some money or make some money. But football season has started. I pick Joe Burrows. Let's go. Uh, let's go Chargers. Actually, he's, he's actually ranked pretty hard for the QBs this year. But let's go Chargers. Let's see what happens. And I hope to be at the Super Bowl rooting on the Chargers. Would that not be amazing? Yeah, Taylor Swift was offered to perform at the Super Bowl halftime show, and she declined it because she's got right. better things to do. Sorry, this is not about Taylor Swift. This is Garrett's 10 seconds. Just saying, I would be there if it was her. As well, if I'm dressed a little fancy and you're watching on YouTube, we just went to a, I guess, nice restaurant to celebrate my grandma's birthday. And we got home and I said, let's record. And I just wanted to take a bath, but you know what? There's nowhere else I'd rather be. <laughs> so we're recording at night again. A little creepy, a little spooky. Let's hop right into it. Our case sources this week are allitsinteresting.com, Cambridge News, the BBC, Ranker, Medium.com, ITV, Daily Star, Vocal Media, Metro.co.uk, and Daily Mail. I just wanted to give a trigger warning before we jump in that we are going to be discussing self-harm in today's episode. Okay, I think it's safe to say that the majority of the cases and the killers we cover on this show have some sort of motive for their crimes, whether it's money or jealousy or even sexual infatuation. By the time the convicted is behind bars, investigators usually have a pretty good idea of what made them tick. Which is why some of the scariest, most disturbing killers are the ones that never share a clear intention behind their crimes and may not even have one at all. Today's story happens to fall into that category, and it's a serial killer crime. Okay. And while you're probably picturing the stereotypical Ted Bundy type, this person does not fit that mold in the slightest. Instead, it's 30-year-old blue-eyed brunette from an English middle-class family. Her name is Joanne, or sometimes she's referred to as Joanna Dennehy. And the reason for her 10-day killing spree? Well, she just wanted to see how it would feel. Wait, this is a female serial killer? A female serial killer. I feel killer. like that is so rare. And we haven't really covered. I don't know if we ever have. So I thought this would be a good case. Interesting. Our story today obviously begins overseas in a bustling yet more residential area just north of London called Hertfordshire, or more specifically in a town called St. Alban with a centuries old cathedral, a picturesque lake and an old Roman theater, which doesn't sound at all like a bad place to be brought up. And Kevin and Kathleen Dennehy probably would have agreed. This is where Kevin, a security guard, and Kathleen, a grocery store worker, decided to settle down and have their two daughters, Joanne in 1982 and Maria in 1984. In her early years, Joanne showed signs of having a bright future. 
She was a hardworking student, well-liked by her teachers. She loved to play hockey and was also a pretty decent musician, to the point where her parents spent their supplemental income on getting her music lessons. Mm, okay. Most people who knew the Dennehys agreed Kathleen and Kevin worked hard to give their girls a happy life. Whenever they got the chance, the Dennehys would take the girls on small trips or vacations, and when they outgrew their St. Alban home, they moved to a bigger house in Harpenden, about a 15-minute drive away. As Joanne became a teenager, her confidence escalated. Many claimed she was quite the flirt and had a magnetic personality that drew both men and women to her. I've always thought that magnetic is such, would be like the highest compliment. It's interesting because it is true. There are some people out there who just have magnetic personalities. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's looks. I don't know if it's like an aura. Yeah. It's just some people you're just more magnetically attracted attracted to like there's people who everyone's just like oh yeah like yeah there's something about them but others said at the same time joanne seemed to already have a dark side according to one of joanne's former schoolmates joanne was a vicious bully to the other kids in her class she once told a girl that she would be better off dead and if the girl wanted to die by suicide joanne said she would help her oh but comments like this seem to be just the beginning of Joanne's bad behavior. When she was 13, she ran away from home for the first time. It happened again a year later in 1992 when a 14-year-old Joanne met an 18-year-old carnival worker. The two ran off together, though Joanne's parents found her several days later at a hostel. Although that didn't stop her from associating with men who were much older. She also began abusing alcohol, marijuana, and cocaine, which caused more fights between her and her parents. And over time, Joanne became more rebellious and sometimes even violent with her parents. She started skipping school and stealing money from them just to fuel her addictions. One afternoon, when she was reprimanded by a teacher for drinking during class, she drunkenly threw the bottle of liquor out the window, breaking the glass and making a run for it. In high school? in high school all right so yeah joanne had basically gone from student of the month to the most feared kid at school before she'd even turned 16 joanne had run away from home a total of eight different times but in 1997 she met the person who'd be her one-way ticket out of her parents house for good that summer joanne met a 21 year old named john trainer while he was out walking his dog after chatting for a bit, the two agreed to meet up the following day. Joanne confessed to John that she'd been having trouble in school and was dropping out. She also told him that her parents had kicked her out of the house, which wasn't exactly true. Still, it didn't take much for Joanne to have John wrapped around her finger. Although he was still living at his mother's house, he asked Joanne if she wanted to move in with them, and she took John up on the offer. Then, only two years into their relationship, Joanne became pregnant with their first daughter. Okay, so she's about 18 at this point? Yep. No longer able to stay in his mother's home, the two got their own apartment in an area called Milton Keynes, about an hour's drive from Joanne's parents' house. Who, by the way, never seemed to come searching for Joanne after that final time that she left home. So, relationship is basically set. Okay, God, I was wondering that. Like, did the parents keep looking for her? Or were they just like, I mean, she's an adult now. She, I don't know, what are you supposed to do? Well, and by this point, John probably understood why. There were plenty of red flags with Joanne, particularly yeah. regarding her unpredictable behavior. He claimed one moment she was loving and caring, sweet as pie, and the next she'd flip a switch, screaming like a banshee and taking her aggressions out on him. Okay. Still, John was madly in love with Joanne and had been since the beginning. And with a baby on the way, he knew he wanted to stay committed to her. That, of course, got more difficult once their daughter, Cheyenne, arrived. Not only did they have a newborn to care for, which could put a strain on even the healthiest relationship, Joanne went right back to drinking, drugs, and she began cutting herself. Okay. The situation got worse as John went back to work as a security guard while Joanne, on state benefits, stayed home with Cheyenne. Eventually, John found out that Joanne had been inviting over an ex-convict that she knew, oh. plus she was having sex with him when John wasn't home. Holy crap. Yeah, so she's having an affair. 
as they have a little newborn at home. Yes. And at this point, John has had enough. He took their daughter and moved back home to his mother's house, leaving Joanne to spiral further. Okay. And I think it's pretty, I mean, I'm obviously not an expert, but I think it's pretty obvious that Joanne probably has some mental health yeah. issues mm -hmm. that are being unaddressed at this point. Yeah, I was curious where this was going to go because I was wondering if it was out of nowhere. It's hard because I, I do think though for a lot of people, killings do seem out of nowhere. Yep. But then you go back and you start reviewing the history and you're like, oh, all the signs, everything was there. This makes total sense. Yes. Uh, but like I think if in comparison to, I mean, we, we talked about Ted Bundy just a little earlier. He, he was way more passing, I would say, mm -hmm. than Joanne because Joanne is clearly exhibiting signs of manic episodes, rages, going yeah, back yeah. to being sweet. Like he was still this, I mean, as bad as, as as bad as it is to say, he was this charming guy that nobody assumed would kill somebody. He maybe rubbed yeah. he, people yeah. he, wrong here and there. But when someone at the school you're going to says you're one of the biggest bullies here, I yeah, mean, that's, that's, that's different. That's different. However, the separation between John and Joanne only lasted a few months. By 2001, Joanne switched on the charm and convinced John she was getting better, that he should take her back. She was no longer spiraling, and it worked. The couple moved back in together. Joanne got a job picking vegetables for a supermarket chain, and for a while it seemed like things were actually going to be good for the two of them until Joanne relapsed. She began drinking heavily again to the point where she would come home and get violent with John, throwing things around the home. John knew the situation was dire when Joanne drunkenly shoved their toddler oh, one no, evening. Oh, no. You cannot do that. Nope. So after that, John took Cheyenne and left once again. For 18 months, John didn't hear from Joanne. But later he learned, after committing assault on a stranger, she'd been sent to a psychiatric ward in Peterborough City Hospital. There, Joanne was diagnosed with a psychotic disorder and was said to be, quote, emotionally unstable and prone to unpredictable behavioral explosions. Okay. Which probably doesn't come as a surprise at this point in the story. Yep. After, instead of being fully released, Joanne spent time behind bars as part of that aggravated assault charge. And she remained in jail until 2004. Shortly after she was freed, Joanne found herself without a place to stay, so she contacted John again. She managed to cast a spell over him once again, and the two gave their relationship another go. By 2006, Joanne was pregnant with their second daughter. John admitted he thought he could maybe help Joanne, that if he removed all of the temptations from her life, maybe he could get her clean. They could all start fresh. But as the saying goes, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Yeah. Well, John Trainer should have seen what was coming because surprise, surprise, once their second child was born, Joanne returned to those old habits. The drugs, the drinking, the sex with strangers in their home. But after her time in prison, the old Joanne was no longer dormant inside of her. The little girl who loved sports and music, who deep down wanted to be a good student, she was completely gone. Prison had made Joanne harder, more calloused, and her appearance reflected that. She'd gotten a tongue ring and a tattoo of a star on her cheek. She'd bulked up, gained some weight, and the self-mutilation was out of control. Mm -hmm. Joanne's stomach was covered in slash marks, which led some professionals to believe she was living with borderline personality disorder. Interesting. I mean, yeah, obviously something's, it's obvious, right? Something's, something's wrong. Yes. Then in 2009, during another heated argument between the couple, Joanne pulled a six-inch serrated blade from her boot. Holy crap. After swinging it violently, she stabbed it through the carpet of their home and screamed, quote, I wish I could effing kill someone. And that was it for John. For Good. real this time. All right, I was going to say, please, John, get the kids and yourself out of there. So I'm glad he did. He grabbed the kids, packed their things, and got out for good, good. a few days later. Okay, okay. Joanne never saw her daughters again after that. Wow. But if Joanne was hurt by losing her kids and her long-term boyfriend, she certainly didn't show it in the ways that you'd think. Because shortly after John left, the now 28-year-old Joanne served a short sentence again for things like shoplifting and openly carrying a razor blade in public. Once she was out on parole, Joanne moved to Peterborough about a two hours drive north of London 
where she met a man named Gary Richards who went by the nickname Stretch. And like many men Joanne had come across, Stretch immediately fell for Joanne's charm. But the 48-year-old was an unlikely match for her. He was extremely tall. And I say this meaning he towered over five foot five Joanne, standing at seven foot three inches. Oh my gosh. I thought you were gonna say like six five, six six, no. seven three. And he weighed over three hundred and twenty pounds. Like he's a giant. He's a giant, yeah. Stretch didn't have much of an IQ or an education for that matter. He was kicked out of his father's home at age 15 and fell into a life of crime. Things like shoplifting, stealing cars, larceny, that kind of thing. But at his size, Stretch also had a long history of standing out and getting caught. Maybe not the kind of guy you want to be your partner in crime, but Joanne felt differently. And in 2010, the two decided they should be roommates, which is like, Worst case scenario, yeah. a criminal meeting another criminal and deciding that, yep, let's do this life of crime together. Uh -huh. From what I can tell, the relationship between them was mostly platonic. Even though Stretch seemed to be pretty much in love with Joanne, it didn't seem that they ever had a romantic relationship. Still, the two got pretty close. Joanne recommended they check out a place called Quicklit, which was a firm that rented out properties to those who had, quote, limited resources meaning low income or ex-convicts yep. like Joanne and Stretch. It was during this initial meeting that she met the property directors, Kevin Lee and his wife, Christina, who ran the program. And when they asked what Joanne was out on parole for, she lied and said she'd served 13 years for murdering her father because he'd sexually abused her. Why would you say that? Why? Well, Why? the story earned the sympathies of Kevin and Christina, who agreed to not only give Joanne and Stretch a place to stay, but if they helped manage his properties, they could live there rent free. It's interesting because I look everything up these days. So it's um, like how many people just believe people that say stuff, mm -hmm. you know, I'd be like, okay, let me look this up to see if you actually killed your father. Right. Well, not that it matters. I've just it's hard if you go just in and a, say, well, he was a, a monster thought. and yeah. he did X, Y, and Z to me. And so I just had to kill him. She probably said it was out of self-defense. It's crazy. I, if someone said that to my face, I'd be like, oh, whoa. Yeah. But they were used to working with ex-convicts. It probably wasn't that, the first person that was out on murder. You they're, know, They're used to these stories all the time. So, or life episodes, I don't yeah. know what you call them. So Joanne took them up on the offer and allowed Stretch to stay on her couch but the job required more than just calling a plumber when someone's toilet was clogged. Since many of the people living at Kevin's properties were down on their luck, Joanne and Stretch took on the role of enforcer. If Kevin was having a problem with a tenant, Joanne and Stretch would knock on their door and threaten the occupant into paying what was owed. One tenant even reported that Joanne had put a knife to their throat after they were late on a payment. Oh my so gosh. he, he kind of, Kevin kind of used these ex-convicts and said go do my dirty work like make sure my bills are paid i mean when a seven foot three guy comes to your door are you gonna say no 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 way but i do have to say the relationship between kevin and joanne evolved from more than just employer and employee on the outside the 49 year old kevin and his wife christina seemed to have a loving healthy marriage they had two children who kevin reportedly doted over but he wasn't always faithful to christina Shortly after meeting Joanne, Kevin seemed to be charmed by her just like the other men in her life. I feel like I need to see what she looks like because all these guys are just falling for her. She's I, magnetic. I just don't understand. Good old magnetic. Gets you every time. It's not clear how their relationship escalated, but it was said that over time, Kevin might have told Joanne about some of his sexual fantasies. Mm. And Joanne, she was willing to play into them. While Kevin kept his encounters with Joanne a secret from his wife, he allegedly told some of his male friends about their blossoming relationship. Wait, Kevin's married? Yes. Her name's Christina. I guess I missed that the other times you said that. All right. Yeah. Well, that makes everything not okay. Yes. And it's actually a good thing that Kevin had told some of his friends about his secret relationship with Joanne because eventually the ticking time bomb that was Joanne Dennehy finally detonated in 2013. Okay. It was a Monday, March 18th, when a 31-year-old Polish man named Lukas Slabuzescu... <laughs> Slabuzes... Slabuzeski? How did you say that? 
Slabo Zazuski. Slabo Zazuski. Had the unfortunate luck of encountering Joanne Dennehy. He was shopping at a mall in Peterborough's when Joanne approached the shy, hazel eyed Lucas. Joanne laid on the charm and quickly began flirting with him. She then got his cell phone number before they parted ways. I don't, I don't, I don't understand this. I don't understand how she's getting everybody's. She need, Mag, she's magnetic. She messed up. What she should have done instead is she should have one not killed people because that's horrible. And two, she should have started a coaching program where she teaches people how to get numbers from whoever they like because she knows what she's doing. I would have. It's not teachable. I would have been. Her some agent, people have it. Some people don't. And I would have made a lot of money. That's just crazy. She's literally any guy she talks to. She's just getting their number. Mm hmm. For the next several hours, Joanne sent him sexually explicit texts and Lucas entertained them. Conversation continued to the point where Joanne asked him to get together again soon. Lucas then texted a friend that night saying he'd found a possible girlfriend and life was beautiful. But the following day, Tuesday, March 19th, was the last time anyone saw Lucas oh, alive. No. That evening, Lucas knocked on Joanne's door and she welcomed him inside. The two began drinking together and at some point moved to the kitchen area. But Joanne didn't have plans to carry out any of these sexual advances she'd made in her texts. Instead, she pulled out a three-inch knife and stabbed Lucas through the heart repeatedly until he was no longer breathing. Meanwhile, Stretch claimed he was upstairs sleeping while the Holy murder happened. Crap. When he woke the next morning... He came downstairs to find the crime scene, after which Joanne asked him to help her move the body. Believing he was already in trouble as he was also out on parole, Stretch gave in to her demands. He helped Joanne move Lucas to a green wheelbarrow out in the garden, but she knew this would only be temporary. She and Stretch had to get their hands on a car to properly dispose of the body. So Joanne called Kevin Lee. She told him that a man had been killed at the apartment, though she didn't say how, who it was, or by who. All she said was she needed some money to buy a car and move the body. Perhaps knowing that Joanne and Stretch had been doing his dirty work, collecting rent around the apartments, Kevin gave in and didn't ask very many questions. Wow. This is now the second guy she's got working for her after she just murdered someone. Instead, he sent Joanne the cash she needed to get a car. That same evening, they were spotted driving around the outskirts of Peterborough, seemingly looking for a spot to get rid of Lucas's body. They eventually left him in the area close to where Stretch had lived several years prior. About a week later, Kevin Lee moved Joanne and Stretch to a new property about a 15-minute drive from the former. And although it's not totally clear why, this may be because Kevin knew about the murder that happened in her previous place. So he's like, dude, there was a murder there. We got to get you out and yeah. on to the next. Regardless of why she moved, Joanne wasn't happy with the arrangement. For starters, she was already upset with Kevin for not paying her some money she was owed. But this new arrangement also came with two new roommates that she didn't want. Still, Kevin promised her the situation wouldn't last long. He had already served eviction notices to the roommates, 56-year-old John Chapman and 36-year-old Leslie Layton. John Chapman was a veteran for the Royal Navy, but he found himself at one of Kevin Lee's properties after falling on hard times. While some said John was a good tenant who mostly paid his rent on time, there were other neighbors who accused John and Leslie of throwing loud parties and trashing the property, which led to an infestation of bed bugs. So Kevin figured by moving Stretch and Joanne in with them that life in the apartment would become untenable. The two guys would be dying to move out in a few short days. Little did Kevin know dying actually would be part of that equation. It was early in the morning on March 29th, 2013. Joanne, Leslie, and a few other friends had spent the night before drinking and partying out in the yard, conjuring up new complaints from the neighbors. Then sometimes around 6.30 a.m., Joanne snuck into John's bedroom where he was sound asleep. She then took a knife and plunged it five separate times oh into my. John's chest. What is happening right now? Two of those times penetrating his heart. She then slashed him one final time in the neck, Cutting his artery, putting an oh. end to his life. I don't like thinking about this because it's insane. But if you're going to kill someone, I get confused on how you can stab someone over like shooting someone. I guess if you don't have access to a gun, then you don't have a gun. Well, and but also it's just, just 
like stabbing someone is so like intimate and just brutal and just like caveman like mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying well and it's just Animalistic. like i said at the beginning no motive he was asleep no i'm i mean didn't you say and i'm sure we'll get to it she just wanted to feel what it was like to kill someone. that's the most disturbing evil thing out of out of like killers killers in general right i mean yeah. usually there's like a motive behind it or you know they my husband cheated on me not saying it's okay to kill them but but it, it, we can at least to kill to kill no sense no well we Zero just can't sense. comprehend you can't wrap your you cannot wrap your mind around right it. so it said john chapman didn't try to fight back with her hands still covered in john's warm blood joanne grabbed his cell phone from the nightstand and called stretch when he picked it up joanne started singing him the britney spears song oops i did it again yeah stretch knew exactly what she was referring to Shortly after, Joanne was washing her hands in the bathroom when Leslie walked in on her. But instead of calling 999, UK's version of 911, Leslie snapped photos of John's dead body. This is the other male roommate. Yeah. Then he went about his day, shopping and running errands. Meanwhile, Stretch and Joanne discussed their next move. They could call Kevin Lee, let him know they took care of the Chapman problem, but then they'd have to tell him about another dead body on his property. And Joanne didn't trust that Kevin could keep two deaths a secret. So in her mind, the only option was take care of Kevin Lee next. What? A few hours later, Joanne called Kevin and asked if he could meet up with her at the old property, the one where she had killed Lucas just a few weeks before. Completely unaware that Joanne had taken a second victim, Kevin said sure. Then he went to the Queensgate Mall and bought a few CDs for his wife and Joanne. That evening, Kevin dropped the gifts off at home for his wife. Then he hopped in his car and went to meet Joanne. Shortly after he arrived, it's believed Joanne might have indulged Kevin in some of his fantasies. Then Joanne put on an Elvis song to set the mood, and finally she attacked. Like her other victims, Joanne used a knife to stab Kevin in the chest five times. I keep in mind, she has like a relationship with yeah. Kevin. Uh -huh. He's not a stranger. But unlike the others, Kevin seemed to put up a fight. He was later discovered with not only injuries to the lungs and heart, but to his hands and fingers as well. It's even rumored that Joanne videotaped this murder. Oh my. She later wrote to a friend that she watched it again over a meal and wine. However, if that were true, I don't believe the tape was ever discovered or cataloged as evidence. Okay. But one thing was for sure. After committing the murder, Joanne once again phoned her right-hand man, Stretch. They now had two bodies they had to get rid of. I can't believe Stretch is just covering for her. Yeah. That's, that that kind of pisses me off. And Joanne knew... I mean, they're both criminals. I, don't, I mean, I don't yeah. know. She knew it would only be a matter of time before Kevin was reported missing. Around 8 p.m. that night, Kevin's wife, Christina, had called two of his friends to ask about him. Knowing about his affair with Joanne, they made the trip over to Joanne's old apartment where they knew she and Kevin had their rendezvous. But almost as soon as they got there, they saw Kevin's Ford leaving, and it appeared to have a mattress sticking out the back of it. What they didn't realize was that the car wasn't being driven by Kevin, their, her husband, who's missing. It was Leslie Layton who had agreed to help the duo with their dirty work. So remember, he was the male roommate yeah. who took pictures of the other roommate who was dead. Now he's getting involved in this murder of Kevin, his landlord. What a complete mess. Well, and just... How does she have so many men working for her? I don't know. Meanwhile, Joanne and Stretch followed closely behind in their car. Um, only now his dead body was tucked in the back. Now, keep in mind, they're following in the car that Kevin bought them yeah. with Kevin's body in the back. The two cars made a quick trip to the gas station. Then around 9.15 p.m. that night, a farmer spotted a vehicle on fire near an isolated spot in Yaxley, about a 15 minutes drive from Peterborough. It was a Ford with a mattress inside. It was Kevin's Ford. After setting the car ablaze, Leslie, Joanne, and Stretch then went back to Leslie's place to get John Chapman's body. They loaded it into the car with Kevin's and made their way out to Thorny Dyke, the same place where Lucas's body was waiting to be discovered. There, they left John Chapman in a ditch. Then at some point that evening, they took Kevin about eight miles down the road to an area called Newborough. There, Joanne carefully positioned Kevin's body off the side of the road. She planted him face down and posed him. I won't, don't need to specify how. Yeah. 
Kevin's body was discovered the very next day, March 30th, by a 68-year-old man out walking his dog. Knowing that Kevin Lee was missing and hearing he'd had a relationship with ex-convict Joanne Dennehy, police went to search the property he'd been renting to her. While Stretch and Joanne were nowhere to be found, the evidence in the property was abundant. Oh, I'm sure. They found plenty of blood, which was a match with both Kevin and Lucas. And it wasn't long before they tied John Chapman's death to the string of murders as well. I mean, it's, he's it's another obvious, tenant. Yeah. While Leslie went a separate way, Joanne and Stretch had decided to keep heading west to avoid the police. They ended up in an area Stretch knew well, Herefordshire. I sure hope I said that right. The duo was spotted together on CCTV footage, and their car's license plate was marked as a vehicle of interest. It wouldn't take long for the police to track Joanne and her accomplice down, but before they could, Joanne would attempt to take two more lives. On April 2nd, Joanne had completely lost all sense of reality. She had asked Stretch to drive her around town because she wanted to find more men to kill. If I was Stretch, I'd be scared for yeah, my I'm, life. I mean, he is seven foot three, 300 Still. pounds. But why? Like, what is, what is he getting out of this? How does he even shut eye around her? I mean, I guess I assume he's getting things as, you know, sexual favors. No? No, their relationship, at least according to her, was completely platonic. Interesting. So literally, I don't know. I confuse what he's getting out of this. Maybe he's sick. Maybe. I mean, obviously. It was around 3.35 p.m. when Joanne spotted 63-year-old Robin Bariza, a former fireman, out walking his Labrador named Samson. Robin could sense a car slowing down behind him, but he didn't pay it much attention. The next thing he knew, he felt a stab to his shoulder. He was being attacked. When he turned, he saw Joanne Dennehy with a satanic look in her eyes. Then she stabbed Robin again. Robin tried to fight back, kicking and hitting Joanne, but he said it had little effect on her. Robin tried to take off running, but Joanne kept on him, refusing to let him go until another car started to pass them by. That's when Joanne hopped back in her car, said thanks to Stretch, and kissed him on the cheek as they drove away. So he literally pulled over to let her stab this guy because she wanted yeah. to, and then they drove away. I don't know. She is absolutely evil. Yeah. Robin was left fighting for his life on the side of the road, but eventually stumbled home and called 999. His life was spared, but Joanne was still out for blood. About nine minutes later, Joanne spotted her next victim. 56-year-old John Rogers, who was out walking his dog, Archie. Much like Robin, John first knew he was being attacked after he felt a blow to his back. When he turned around, Joanne began stabbing John in the chest. Between blows, John asked her why she was doing this, but Joanne showed no emotion. She didn't seem to be taking pleasure from the attack, nor did she show any remorse. Instead, it seems like it was just business as usual for her. After several more blows, John felt himself collapsing to the pavement. She then took his dog, Archie, hopped in the car, and left John no, there to die. No, not the freaking dog. When all was said and done, John had been stabbed over 30 times by Joanne on the side of the road. Okay. Both of his lungs had collapsed, oh. his ribs were fractured, and his bowel was pierced and partially exposed. But still, John was alive. Both of Joanne's new victims were taken to Hereford County Hospital and treated for their injuries, and both lived to tell the Jeez. story. Okay, good. But Joanne was coming to the end of hers, or at least this chapter. Later that day, she and Stretch were caught and arrested. She was brought into the local station, booked and fingerprinted. Footage taken in the station showed Joanne flirting with the officers and joking about the murders. At one point, she compared the casualness of her murders to, quote, going down for a Sunday roast. Then, the following day, April 3rd, a local farmer discovered the bodies of Lucas and John Chapman out in Thorny Dyke. When Gary Stretch Richards and Leslie Layton were later asked about their involvement with Joanne, they claimed they were both intimidated by her. Despite being almost two feet taller than her, Stretch insisted he was too afraid of Joanne to tell her he didn't want to participate in her crimes. And as for Joanne's motive, she claimed that killing men was simply good entertainment. During a psychiatric examination, she told one doctor, quote, I killed to see how it would feel, to see if it was as cold as I thought. Then it got Moorish, meaning she wanted more of it, and I got a taste for it. That's so, I don't, I just, there's not much more I can say because I just can't comprehend it. I can't understand it. 
Doesn't make sense. By May 8th, 2013, Joanne Dennehy was charged with three counts of murder and two counts of attempted murder. She was also charged with three counts of preventing a decent burial of a body. Her case was so serious that it was then escalated to the Crown Court, which is one of the three senior courts in England and Wales. Joanne pleaded guilty on all charges and was sentenced to life in prison with no option for parole. Hey, they, she needs to be exiled to like some random island in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, she's probably going to freaking... She's going to kill people in prison. Make the prison guards fall in love with her. Seriously. Mind you, she was one of only three women in the history of the UK to be given a life sentence without parole. As for Stretch, he received a minimum of 19 years for preventing lawful and decent burial, as well as two attempted murder charges. Leslie Layton received 14 years on the same decent burial charges, as well as perverting the course of justice. And that's sort of where you think the story ends. But Joanne Dennehy had a whole other chapter of disturbing and manipulative tales ahead of her. In May 2016, Joanne was serving time at HMP Bronzeville in Surrey, England, about a 50 minutes drive west of the center of London. The then 34-year-old Joanne had been keeping a diary that was discovered by prison authorities just before she carried out another vicious attack. The journal illustrated Joanne's plans for an escape saying she was going to kill a female guard, take her keys, then chop off her fingers so she could get past the biometric systems. Had authorities not discovered Joanne's blueprints, there's a good chance she would have actually followed through on the attack. Instead, Joanne was moved to solitary confinement. By July 2018, however, she shifted her interest to something more creative, for lack of a better word. She began penning erotic fiction that she hoped would one day be turned into a movie. But one source claimed the story was just a compilation of Joanne's dark and twisted fantasies, a tale of a female protagonist who had sex with men before stabbing them to death. I mean, hey, they say, right, what you know. It was around this same time that Joanne had begun dating her new cellmate, 38-year-old Haley Palmer. Shortly after, she asked the prison governor for permission to marry Haley, but Haley's family insisted the governor refuse the request. They were terrified that a relationship with Joanne would put Haley in more danger. And they were right. Yeah, 100%. Because in August of that year, Haley and Joanne attempted a joint suicide. Joanne had slit her own throat while Haley had cut both of her wrists. Guards found them both in an embrace on the floor and rushed to get them treatment. They both survived, but were then separated and taken to different prisons. Although that didn't keep the couple apart forever. By 2021, Haley had finished her 16-year robbery sentence and was released. Despite the advice of her family, Haley agreed to get engaged to Joanne under Mm. one condition. There couldn't be any more death. Joanne agreed and for a time actually began behaving in her new prison, HMP Low Newton in Durham. But then the disturbing letters to Haley continued. If there's anything I know about this chick, nothing you say matters. Since her imprisonment, neither Joanne's parents nor her sister have been to visit her. Neither has the father of her children, John. As for Joanne's daughters, her eldest felt she had to pay the price for her mother's sins. After being bullied at school over the news of her mother, Uh. Cheyenne lived with depression. When she turned 16, Cheyenne stepped forward on her mother's behalf to apologize to all of the victim's Uh, families. Which, that's... No, it has nothing to do with her at all. No. Nothing to do with her. And anyone that bullied her because of it... You suck. Yeah. You're 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 a loser. And Joanne to this day has not showed one ounce of remorse. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. And she's never given a good reason for her crimes. No. To her having a little fun seemed to be all the motive she needed, which is perhaps one of the scariest motives of all, and that is the Peterborough ditch murders. Insane. I you got to kill people, man. Like White people got to die for no reason. They're just living life. Life's already hard Walking enough. Walking their dogs. Life's already hard enough. Did he ever get the dog back? I'm sure. Hope so. Also, really hard for her family because now the daughters have to live with this. The husband. It's, it's just a cycle that they have to go through hard things and deal with all this when it has nothing to do with them. So that, I mean, that sucks. It's our motto. Yep. There's always more victims than just the victims. Yep. All right, you guys, that is it for this week. And we will see you next with another episode. I love it. And I hate it. Goodbye. <laughs>